And now it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Joseph Zalmanowitz. He's a partner in Stalin Zalmanowitz, and he will introduce United States Attorney uh, Loretta E. Lynch. Thank you very much. Uh, with due deference to uh, my good friend Rabbi Zwiebel, many of us in this room are very familiar with our next speaker, Ms. Loretta Lynch, the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. Ms. Lynch first served in that capacity back in 1999 and then joined the firm of Hogan and Hartson and the partner in their New York office. It takes a special person, someone devoted to her community, and someone with a commitment to justice to then leave the lucrative halls of a major law firm to reassume her public career as United States Attorney. Yes, it does. We are very fortunate and delighted to have her back. There is a Jewish expression which is mixas shuachai b'fana. When we have a person in front of us, we only impart part of the praise to that person. And we do not say all of it. But I will only be repeating what many people have said before me. Our United States Attorney is brilliant, dedicated, and above all, she is fair. As U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District, Ms. Lynch oversees all federal and civil investigations and cases <coughs> in Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and Nassau and Suffolk counties, from drug trafficking to terrorism-related prosecutions. It is a tremendous load to handle, and handle it she does. We can truly count on her to keep America and our community safe from those who wish them harm. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor to introduce the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, the Honorable Loretta Lynch. Good morning. And thank you so much for that gracious introduction. I also want to thank you so much for the gracious welcome that I've received this morning from this entire group. Uh, the leaders of Aguda Israel, uh, thank you and your planning committee for inviting me. I want to thank Mr. Ezra Friedlander for uh, working on the uh, He's been a great help. I shall miss our Friday morning chats. <laughs> and it's with great pleasure that I learned that he and I will soon be having future meetings so that we can speak again. But Ezra, it must be on Friday morning as we have discussed. Uh, I want to thank you also uh, for this event. The Legislative Breakfast is a wonderful idea. Um, it was my pleasure to meet not just the leaders here locally, uh, but also some of your national leaders, Rabbi Swadell, my partner in law. You have, you have an office in our uh, district anytime you choose to come back and begin your practice as well. I'd like to also introduce. <laughs> I'd like to also introduce uh, Mr. Marshall Miller. He's the Deputy Chief of my Criminal Division. He's here with me today. One of the leading terrorism prosecutors in this nation. Supervised many of our most serious terrorism cases, including those of Najib Zazi that he plotted to blow up the subway system, and was the lead prosecutor on the most recent cases involving the plot to blow up fuel tanks at JFK Airport. He is an invaluable resource to me and a friend to all of you as well. So I'm delighted he was able to join me. Aguda Israel is an organization that focuses on the engagement of the issues of the day as well as a community focus. This is particularly important as we look at issues involving national security as well. Your focus on both policy, the law, as well as the everyday matters of what happens in your community are exactly what is needed as we face these challenging times. It is the hallmark of the critical thinking and collective action that we in government try and bring to bear as well. Now, as you heard, this is my second time around in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, and I have to say, I have been truly fortunate to have this opportunity to return to a job in an office where I learned so much and a work that I truly love. Now, there have, of course, been major changes in the 
prosecutorial landscape since my first time in office. I was a prosecutor in the Eastern District from 1990, seems like just yesterday, to May of 2001, just before the seminal events that changed the way in which we engage with the terrorism community. The recent anniversary of these terrorist attacks of 9-11 have provided us an opportunity to focus on those changes, and there have been many generated by that horrific event. But, quite, quite frankly, also many changes that were in place and working towards us before that event even happened. Now, as you all know, national security has been placed on the forefront of our national and our local priorities. Because of our location, because of the focus of which New York has, we continue to remain a target, and we continue to remain on high alert. In my office, as well as throughout the Department of Justice, the focus has shifted to fully encompass not just the prosecution of terrorist activity, although as I'll discuss in a few moments, we do focus on that, but also the prevention of the next terror attack. To that end, our terrorism prosecutors, led by Marshall Miller and others, have truly become national security lawyers, working closely with not just law enforcement agencies, although we do, but also with our military and our intelligence communities, sharing information and pooling resources in ways not seen prior to 9-11. We work closely with the FBI's New York Joint Terrorism Task Force, which includes the NYPD, to immediately mobilize when any terrorism lead is received, to use every investigative and prosecutorial tool to detect and to deter a terrorist attack without delay. Our goal is to incapacitate the attack before it occurs. We will stand there and prosecute, of course, but our primary goal is prevention. Now, the response to the current terror threat must be fully engaged, and I submit to you it must be three-dimensional. Law enforcement must be responsive, military actions must be taken, and the intelligence community must be fully mobilized. All three are essential in fighting this battle. And this is because what we've learned over the last decade is the nature of the threat has shifted as well to encompass not just the large-scale attack that we so sadly saw here on 9-11, and even before that, the bombing of the naval ship, the USS Cole, Cobar Towers, the 1998 embassy bombings, those large-scale, large planning attacks, but the current mobilization and focus of Al-Qaeda and related groups the mobilization of the lone wolf terrorists. This is a major shift, at least in how Al-Qaeda is operating in the Western world. The lone wolf terrorist, coached by the larger group, but often acting alone, such as, of course, the Fort Hood shooter, such as, of course, Faisal Shahzad, who tried to blow up Times Square most recently. Another major change that we see as Al-Qaeda warps to try and respond to us is the rise of the homegrown extremist. These are U.S. citizens by birth or by choice who choose the Fatah over freedom and dedicate their efforts to harming their fellow Americans, both at home and abroad. Of great importance as well is the rise in the strategic marketing used by Al-Qaeda and related groups with internet appeals to disaffected youth worldwide. In the Eastern District of New York alone, many of the terrorism defendants that we see note the internet provocations of recently terminated cleric Anwar al as a prime motivator for their actions. The glossy English language magazine, Inspire, formerly edited by the also recently terminated Samir Khan, another US citizen who left this country turn against us, but it could rival fortune in its book and rivals soldier of fortune in its dedication to violence. Al-Qaeda itself has gone global, no longer based solely in the caves of Afghanistan. We have Al-Qaeda operating in the Arabian Peninsula, in East Africa, as well as several entrenched cells in Europe. Now, within the Eastern District of New York, the results of our post-9-11 national security approach have been nothing short of extraordinary. Our investigative and prosecutorial efforts have detected and prevented numerous terrorist attacks in our subways, our trains, our airports, and most importantly, against our people. Those efforts have secured critical intelligence, important convictions, and long prison sentences. 
and of course, on the military front, our achievements nationally are becoming the stuff of legend as we focus on and terminate senior Al-Qaeda leadership, such as Anwar al-Awlaki, Samir Khan, and of course, Osama bin Laden. But the, the national debate over the best methods and methods to keep us safe continues. Now that debate is a good thing. Our leaders are working to keep us safe, and we all have to participate in the dialogue. And as I mentioned, as the nature of the threat has changed, so must the nature of our response. But we must be careful of efforts that, while well-intentioned, would serve instead to make us more vulnerable. I speak of the current debate over the validity of Article III courts, our federal courts, as the appropriate venue for terrorism prosecutions. Through both public debate and current proposed legislation, with different versions currently in the U.S. Senate and the House, some of our leaders, again, with a complete and appropriate focus on our safety, would severely limit the ability of our federal courts to adjudicate terrorism cases, preferring instead to send them to military commissions. Now, I do not stand before you and argue that we should not use military commissions. Indeed, there is a significant place for them as well in our arsenal. And my point is not that our federal courts should be the only method of dealing with terrorism suspects. Rather, my point is that our federal courts are a proven and effective method of dealing with terrorism suspects, particularly in the international environment in which we increasingly operate. And we should not be deprived of this vital tool. Let us take a few minutes and look at some of the advantages that we bring to the battle. First and foremost, the breadth and depth of the scope of federal charges that can be deployed against a terrorism suspect is an invaluable tool. Obviously, when we have direct terrorism threats, we charge those, we prosecute those, we convict defendants based on those. But the federal courts have a panoply of offenses in our arsenal money laundering charges, tax evasion, immigration violations, firearms violations, racketeering violations, and, in my own favorite, I can forfeit their assets when located, <laughs> depriving an organization of funding, cutting off its lifeblood, must be an important tool in our arsenal as well. Of course, the classic example from years gone by is Al Capone, a gangster, one of the original mafia leaders, brought to justice on tax evasion charges, but in prison no less succinctly. Not just the scope of charges that are available in federal court, but the scope of defendants as well. And this is an important issue, particularly as we have seen this morphing of the threat from Al-Qaeda and related groups. Federal courts remain the best and often the only option for prosecuting U.S. citizens with terrorism offenses. And sadly, we are seeing more and more U.S. citizens in those ranks, from Madunjimin and Amadwe, who plotted with Sazi to blow up our subways, to Kazuk, who traveled overseas to fight against U.S. troops in the Middle East and the Balkans, to David Headley, who helped plan the terror attacks in Mumbai, India, to disaffected young men from the Midwest and even more locally, who attempted to, to fly overseas to join Al-Shabaab. We increasingly see the face of homegrown extremism as one of our own, who cannot be tried in a military commission. Federal courts have also established and effective mechanisms to obtain cooperation from defendants, and I cannot underscore how important the cooperation and the intelligence that we gather from these suspects is in the fight against terror. This is a major advantage and difference from the commission system. Based on past successes, this is key. That cooperation is often shared with other countries as well, as we face a threat with many tentacles. Plus, it benefits our partners in the war on terror. It also helps when we need cooperation from other law enforcement agencies overseas, being able to provide information to help the terror attack in Europe or the Middle East leads to increased cooperation and provision of information for us as well. As has been stated publicly, we have seen terrorism suspects in the federal system providing information on a number of things, including such vital information as the phone numbers and email addresses used by Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda's recruiting techniques, their finances, 
their location, the trade craft that Al-Qaeda uses to avoid detection by our own intelligence community, their experiences at the location of training camps, their weapons programs, their explosive programs. We have received information about the location of Al-Qaeda safe houses, including the drawing of maps, residential locations of senior Al-Qaeda figures, their communications methods, their security protocols, the identity of operatives in past attacks as well as planned attacks that have enabled us to bring charges against an ever larger group of defendants, as well as information about plots to attack our own homeland. Why would we want to constrict that flow of vital information? And I submit that as we have this debate about this, the appropriate forum in which to bring these charges, this factor must be a key part of that discussion. As also I've mentioned, many of our terrorism cases, as well as our other cases, increasingly have an international component. We frequently extradite foreign nationals to the US to face terrorism and other charges. Many countries, particularly in Western Europe, will place a condition on their extradition that the defendant only go to a federal court and not to a military commission. The choice there would be stark. It would be between prosecuting the defendant in federal court or letting him go free. And my friends, that is not an option. My friends, we must no more immunize terrorists from federal prosecution than we would immunize them from a military attack. Now I understand the desire for what can seem like a simple solution, a guarantee of sorts, if you will. I understand the motivation to improve all of our systems. And as I have mentioned, people on both sides of the debate have our best interests at heart and are focused on the best way of protecting us. They are working to protect us as best they know how. But by cutting off a proven method of success is, I submit to you, not the way to do that. We cannot act out of fear in this regard. Fear gives us tunnel vision, and we only see one threat straight ahead, not how it has spread to our side and to our flank. Fear makes us search for that magic bullet solution, rather than look at the hard work that must be done on so many fronts. Fear has us reduce our enemies to sound bites and catchphrases, as if by reducing them to a simplistic phrase, we can reduce our needs to a simple solution. Would that it were so. But fear, my friends, does not let us see the successes that we have had. Over 400 terrorists convicted in federal courts across this country since 9-11, many of them serving life sentences, and many of them giving us all of us, law enforcement, military, and the intelligence community, and other countries giving us valuable information on the inner workings of Al-Qaeda. Fear focuses only on what we have to lose, not on the skills that we have gained, and we have gained so much. When operational terrorists Najibul Azazi and Zareen Amajed trained with Al-Qaeda, gathered chemicals, constructed explosive devices, and targeted the New York City subway system for suicide attacks. Federal agents and federal prosecutors tracked their movements, arrested them, convicted them of terrorism offenses, and extracted critical intelligence to deter future attacks. When Al-Qaeda operative Bryant Neal Venus, a disaffected young man from Long Island, traveled to Pakistan and plotted with Al-Qaeda leaders to bomb the Long Island Railroad, Federal agents and federal prosecutors identified the threat, gathered the evidence needed, and brought Venus to justice. Not only was the threat of the railroad disruption, but we gathered critical intelligence that has helped keep Al Qaeda on the run. When homegrown terrorist Russell DeFreitas formed a plot to attack JFK Airport, conducted video surveillance of the airport's fuel tanks and pipelines, and traveled overseas to present his plot to Al-Qaeda and Iranian terrorists, federal agents and federal prosecutors detected the plot, protected the airport, arrested the perpetrators, and convicted them of terrorism crimes resulting in life sentences. 
One of those defendants, Abdul Qadir, a Shiite imam, former member of parliament, former mayor of a major city in Guyana, was arrested en route to Iran to present the plan to blow up JFK's fuel tanks and pipelines. Qadir was closely linked to Mohsen Rabani, the indicted mastermind of the 1994 terrorist attack against the Jewish Cultural Center in Buenos Aires. Federal agents and federal prosecutors, the federal prosecutor sitting at his table with me, put Mr. Qadir in prison for the rest of his life. And when Tamil Tiger operatives attempted to purchase one million dollars worth of service-to-air missiles right here on Long Island, when homegrown terrorists tried to bomb the Herald Square subway station in Manhattan, and when jihadists from New York City tried to travel overseas to attack American troops, federal prosecutors and federal agents detected those threats, gathered the evidence and the intelligence, and secured important terrorism convictions. Now, my friends, when I say we must not be led by fear, I do not mean that we should not be practical and recognize the danger. I do not mean that we should not be realistic and aware of the risks of modern life. But life has always had its risks. For the past 200 years, each generation has faced a seminal threat to their existence. Let us face today's threat with all the skills and tools that we can muster honed by experience, tempered with wisdom, and guided by our common goal to stop terrorist attacks before they happen, to deter future attacks, and to bring terrorists to justice. I want to thank you for your time, and I want to thank you for your attention in this very important matter. Congratulations on this wonderful, wonderful event.